I don't know what most white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institution. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. Today's topic is the cost of racism. We explore the financial cost of racism and what it means for everyone in our country and even the world. We hope you enjoy the discussion. All right, first episode of the new year. So, Garen, uh, what are we going to be talking about today? The cost of racism. Okay. What is it? First, I want to preface before we get into it. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how racism harms all of us, including white people. And part of it, we're going to talk about the ways that it harms the black community, but we're also going to talk about how it hurts the white community. And I just want to preface by stating in a deliberate, compelling way that the reason to avoid racism is not because it costs you as a white person. It's because you exist to love people. We are called to love people. That's why we are here, is to love. And that love benefits all of us. But the root of it is love and concern for others, not just self-interest. One of the criticisms that the critical race theory makes of white people is that historically there's this accusation that white people have only responded and push back against racism in ways that fit with our own self-interest. And that is largely true. I don't think it's entirely true. I think there's times where you can look at history and see white people in you know, the Underground Railroad or some of the white pastors who came and suffered in the civil rights marches, um, where you can see that they weren't operating in their own self-interest. But I think that the broader white culture generally has backed away from racism. And we've talked about this in other episodes, we've largely done so not from true repentance and love, but oftentimes for various pragmatic reasons. So we're going to talk later in this episode how about how some of the white community's willingness to back down from some of the overt racism in our culture during the civil rights movement was because there was bad PR that we were getting in the Cold War, communist propaganda that was being used to make America look bad. And so there are many instances like this in history where white people have responded in ways that are good, but for wrong reasons Okay, to try to avoid the cost of racism to ourselves. So I just want to say that ahead of time. It is costly. Racism is hurting all of us. And we should stop it because it is foolish. It's like shooting ourselves in the foot. But that's not the highest reason to stop it. The highest reason is to love. Yeah. So with that said, today in America, nine of the 10 poorest states are in the South, along with seven of the 10 least educated. Mm. The former Confederate states are in most measurable ways lagging behind the rest of the country because racism is harming all of us. Harvard economist Nathan Nunn found that counties, county by county level, that the counties that relied the most on slavery in 1860 had lower per capita incomes in 2000. So at a county by county level, you can predict the local economy of a county correlates with how many slaves they had, how reliant they were on slavery. And so why is that? Why are we at a county by county level doing worse in places where we relied more on slavery? I think there's, there's a couple different aspects of it. But a big component is that in places where there is more of a mentality of zero-sum game, this thought of the only way I can benefit is by harming others, we oftentimes make decisions that don't work in the real world because the real world is not zero-sum game. The field of economics has all kinds of information about how we can have mutual benefit. The whole idea of an economy is that we mutually benefit one another. So the real world is not a zero-sum game world, but racism operates with that assumption that the only way I can grow is by keeping you down. Mm -hmm. And so in more racist societies or more racist subcultures or more racist counties or locations, there's this mentality of us versus them. 
And that mentality tends to say, I don't want to fund or pay for any public benefit that will be shared broadly Mm. because I don't want them to benefit from it. And so in more racist locations and areas, and this is true in America, it's true in other parts of the world, there will be an underfunding of public benefits that end up harming everyone. So in 1857, for example, uh, Hinton Rowan Helper, author and critic of slavery, counted the number of public institutions in slave states versus free states. He found that in Pennsylvania, there were 393 libraries, and in South Carolina, there were 26. In Maine, there were 236 libraries, and in Georgia, there were 38. Hmm. In New Hampshire, there were 2,381 schools, and in Mississippi, there were 782. There was a reticence to fund public benefits all across the South, and that's continued through time. And Throughout the South, white communities would fill in pools with concrete when they were desegregated. So they would lose a public benefit because they were unwilling to share it. For example, in Montgomery, Alabama, the Oak Park Pool was the grandest pool in the community, But when they were forced to integrate, they chose to empty and close the pool rather than share it with their black neighbors. Thus, the white community also lost pool access. In defiance of segregation, Montgomery closed every single public park. They padlocked the community center and sold all the animals in the zoo. They lost all of it because they were unwilling to share. In New Orleans, they closed the Audubon, the largest pool in the South for seven years. In St. Louis, the Fairgrounds Pool Park had a capacity of 10,000 swimmers. It was perhaps the largest pool in the world until it was drained and closed. And there's other examples all over. So we talked about this a little bit in the last episode, how there's this thing called last place aversion, where people would rather harm themselves in order to stay out of last place. Like if if somebody's making a dollar an hour more than the minimum wage, they are going to want there not to be an increase to the minimum wage because they don't want to become the new minimum wage worker if, right. the, if it's raised by a dollar. Yeah. Even though an increase in the minimum wage will tend to push up all low wages. So that being true, let, let me define a concept that's going to show up here a little bit in the next couple things we're going to talk about. So let me just explain the concept real quick of racial resentment, a term that we're going to use a couple times in the rest of this episode. Racial resentment is not someone saying that they resent black or brown people, but it's just like a term for the way we can measure someone's racial attitudes. And so the way sociologists will kind of capture or measure this is by asking, just probing questions about their general attitudes towards black people. The people who assign more blame to black people and say that they're lazy or less hardworking are going to score higher on a racial resentment scale. So with that in mind, I have a quote from Heather McGee, who wrote the book, The Sum of Us. She said, quote, dog whistle politics is gaslighting on a massive scale, stoking racism through insidious stereotyping, but then denying that race has anything to do with it. In 2016, 53% of white moderates and 69% of white conservatives said they believe black people take more than they give. So they resist change that help the poor, even if those policies are good for everyone. For example, racism increases the likelihood that someone opposes climate action. Among white Republicans, those with low racial resentment scores are 27% more likely to believe that climate change is real. When was this done? The study is in 2016. Oh, wow. So 27%, like the fact that racial resentment is that predictive of whether somebody believes that climate change, which is something that is a broad benefit, like if we have a good climate, that helps literally everyone. But people who have high racial resentment are much more likely to think climate change is not real and not to want to fund that broad benefit. Because it's this perception of, I don't want social policies. They're going to help everyone because I want to stay ahead. Yeah. A study conducted in 2016, another one, which researchers simply switched the photo of a man posing in front of a house with a closure sign between a white and a black photo. And by doing that, they made Trump supporters angrier about government mortgage assistant programs and more likely to blame the individual for their circumstances. 
So just that kind of subliminal action of changing who white people see buying the homes around them can make them change their attitudes about whether they support or against government housing assistance. Mm. According to NES data, white people with the high levels of racial resentment against black people are more opposed to government spending generally. And NES is part of the Census Bureau, and they have a 60-point difference. There's a 60-point difference in support for increased government spending based on whether a white person has high or low racial resentment. That is... Wow. That, that almost makes that like the only deciding factor, like yeah. 60% difference. White supremacy accuses black people of being undeserving and so will tear apart the web that supports everyone, including white people, in order to try to maintain the racial difference in Mm. the caste system. An example of this happened with voting that we talked about in the voting episode, how the voting rates in many southern states, whenever they implemented poll taxes, the voting of white poor people plummeted substantially like the the rate of votership for white people went from in some of those states around 70 percent to around 20 percent so the the same barriers that were erected to keep black people out of the ballot box was also keeping white poor people out yeah and thus hurting and causing underrepresentation of the interests of white poor people but the white poor community still supported those actions because of last place aversion yeah In the presidential election of 1944, the national voter turnout was 69%, but poll tax states managed a scant 18%. Voter ID laws are the kind of modern day version of this, and they do disproportionately hurt black people, but they also hurt poor white people. Only 5% of white voters lack a photo ID, but 19% of white voters who make less than $25,000 a year don't have a driver's license or passport. So 19% of the poorest white people also don't have the ability to vote if there's laws that make it more difficult without photo ID. So I don't know if you're going to talk about this, and if you are, we can cut it. But Carol Anderson's white rage, she kind of talks about the phenomenon of what you're talking about, how white rage plays out in voting or supporting or uplifting systems that hurt black people, but also hurt the white people who are perpetuating or voting these things, you know, voting for these things. And it just goes back to enslavement with white elites and just even the establishment of whiteness as a construct. Blackness is a construct, but whiteness is also a construct. And it's built around white elites looking at, because when enslavement, you know, when it first took off in America specifically, white people were against slavery because they felt like they lose opportunities to work because, of course, you can't compete with enslavement and free labor. And so to bridge that gap and to get poor white people to buy into enslavement, it was like, we're going to make you better than them and we're going to make you overseers. And they basically constructed this poor white class that at least you're not these, you're not a black person, at least you're not a Negro, at least you're not an indigenous person. Mm -hmm. And that divide, it it just continues to be perpetuated today. Like it's just recycled and reimagined and reconstructed and reinvented with each generation. And the language has changed and it becomes more vague and hard to tie to racism. But then, like you were saying, the numbers and the stats and the data, they don't, it doesn't lie. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and, it, and it reveals their basis for like that they don't love other people. Even to their own detriment and demise. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's like a general lack of care and concern for the poor, which to be clear, the Bible says dozens of times that God defends the rights of the poor and needy and calls us to do the same. So many of these people who are willing to throw the poor under the bus in order to throw black people under the bus are people who also claim to believe the scripture and that it's authoritative and yet they are in defiance of what God actually says he cares about which God over and over lists the poor among the group of vulnerable people that he specially protects and fights for. Yeah, and to quote Adam Thomason, who's 
on a previous episode, you've been duped. Mm. Like you think you're doing the right thing and you've just been tricked. Mm -hmm. And she looks at, back to Carol Anderson, she looks at the process of trying to hinder black advancement and achievement through political discourse. Mm -hmm. So just all of the polarizing, all of the craziness that we're seeing now is nothing new, of course. And it's just a reinvention or I don't even know what to call it. Well, it's really, they're taking advantage of it, of the last place aversion on in policies, mm-hmm. yeah, in politics, they're just taking advantage of it. Okay, so I'm just going to run through more examples of ways that racism is costing all of us. So one would be in the area of patents. If black inventors don't patent and release inventions, that hurts everyone because then people aren't benefiting. The whole society is not benefiting from those inventions. And so the economist Lisa D. Cook studied black patent rates and found that initially, after emancipation, they tracked with white patent rates. But that then, once Plessy versus Ferguson legalized segregation, a gap started to grow. And you could actually predict the size of the gap based on the number of lynchings per capita, where a 1% increase in lynchings per capita correlated with an equivalent drop in black patents. And then major riots like the Tulsa riot or similar riots that were Atlanta or St. Louis or across the country, that those in those areas, there was a 14% drop in black patents. So what is the connection there? Why is a black person less likely to file for a patent? Well, it's because black people realize that there was this threat of terrorism, that if you succeed, you're going to be a target because you are in this caste system and we're going to potentially kill you if you rise up from the place that's assigned to you. And so black inventors also just their patents weren't protected well, which was another cause of the drop. And they realized, well, if the government's not going to protect my patent, then I'm not going to file for it. I would rather just kind of do my secret sauce in secret and keep it a secret. And so America actually missed out on an estimated 1,100 patents as a result of this racism, Mm -hmm. like when you do the math. How much wealth did black people lose from 1,100 patents that we're not generating wealth over the course of, you know, a hundred years. But also how much did that cost the economy of America as a whole? Most of the benefits of new inventions go to the general population, not to the inventor. The inventor probably gleans like a small percent of the benefit. And for that person, that's going to add up to be a huge amount. But most of the benefit gets distributed to everyone who is able to use the, you know, the newer iPhone or the newer invention, the right. newer product. Yeah. But just think about how black people, that exploitation of black potential wealth and generational wealth, people complain about so-called welfare queens and they believe that black people are fleecing the system and blah, 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 blah. But when black people have tried to advance and throughout history when, you know, when black people's ideas and patents and creations and inventions and innovation was stolen... That took away wealth opportunities for black people that now the system, you know, if you want to look at it just from a base, like the system has to pay for, Mm -hmm. you still have to pay for the fact that black people have been rendered impoverished Mm -hmm. without, I mean, look at black, look at reparations. The fact that there has been no reparations is costing the country more than if they would have given black people 40 acres and a mule after enslavement. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, because black people proved that they could create their own colleges because they had to out of because of segregation and many of these institutions still stand and stand strong. I mean, look at how black people have thrived historically in spite of oppression, knowing that there was suppression, there was intimidation, people's property were, was destroyed, people were lynched just for it, you know, being considered uppity and think about Rosewood, think about Tulsa, all these riots that basically was an act against black achievement. Mm -hmm. If none of that would have happened where black people would be right now Mm -hmm. and how that could be better for the economy, for the country, for race relations in general. Because think not just how much wealth, uh, so taking those patents as an example, but I mean, you could 
also take the a lot of examples of this that all the wealth that black people were denied. Yeah, the GI Bill. Alone yeah, the GI is Bill. Huge. The, mm-hmm. Like just redlining, having no post slavery land, just that they were freed into immediate debt, having owing money for the very house that they went back to with mm-hmm. nothing. Mm-hmm. That that has generated a system in which not only have black people not been able to like apply for all the patents, but how many businesses didn't get started that would have benefited the whole society because black people, black entrepreneurs haven't had access to capital. And what's crazy is think about right now, black women are the most educated people group and we make up the most percentage of entrepreneurs with all of the wage disparities, health disparities. I mean, when you look at the maternal mortality rate, the infant mortality rate, when you look at housing disparities that still exist, I mean, there's so many ways that black women continue to be oppressed. The stereotypes, the standards of beauty, the cultural appropriation. Just think if we would have been left alone <laughs> mm-hmm. and, you know, if our families weren't attacked, if mass incarceration hadn't, you know, impacted the nuclear black family. Just think about how many waves and ripples. hmm that systemic oppression has created that, and it's the very thing that white people complain about today against white people, that the construct and the institution of white, whiteness and racism created. And we still, we, like Maya Angelou has said, we, still we rise, like we still have risen, but just think about how much more mm-hmm. and how much less taxing it would be on the government if they would have just done right by us in the first place mm-hmm. or left us alone to build, you know, to build and not every time we build something up, tear it down, burn it down, lynch, kill, rape. Like, it's it's insane. Yeah. Or even unemployment. Unemployment is a, first of all, it's a leading predictor of criminal behavior that young men who are unemployed are the main, white or black, regardless of race, that's going to be the main demographic that is committing crime. And so young black men are have a much harder time getting a job because of racism and because of racial stereotyping, leaving many more of them unemployed. But that is then a cost that filters through the whole system because then crime rates are predictably higher because of unemployed men who need something to do with their time. And if you if society forbids them to do anything productive with their time, then society pays a cost for that and then pays a cost to incarcerate. The, we've talked before in the mass incarceration series about how the total cost of incarceration, when you add it all up, it's like $500 billion a year. The direct cost of incarcerating is about $295 billion a year. But it's not just the direct cost because there's also an indirect cost because everyone who's being incarcerated is someone who is then not working, not doing a job, not contributing to the economy, not able to raise their kids, not able to be a productive member of society. And so that cost is another 2.2 million people who aren't participating in our economy. And the Mm -hmm. average in America, the average GDP per capita, so the average contribution divided by the number of people, is about $63,000 per year. So when you factor that in, that's another $140 billion a year for incarcerated people, the the cost that society bears for the fact that they are not working. And without racism, you would still have incarceration. But incarceration is about eight times higher in America than in similar developed nations. So mass incarceration is costing us the lion's share of $500 billion a year. In 2016, the total number of arrests for marijuana possession exceeded the total number of arrests for all violent crimes. It's like mostly coming from marijuana and just possession of marijuana. So by 2016, 18 states were spending more on jails and prisons than on higher education. So what if we actually invested money in people having futures rather than in ending them? That would benefit all of us. Speaking of education, states earn 3 to $4 of dividend for every dollar that they invest in public universities. Because if a state pays for a university, people get college education, they then get jobs earning higher income and pay higher income taxes back to the state. 
or they buy bigger houses and pay higher property taxes back to the state. So states actually earn a dividend on education. And it's estimated, economists estimate it's 3 to $4 per dollar that they invest in education. So with that, it's like, why wouldn't states or the federal government want to provide subsidies for education? I mean, we already do for non-college education, for like grade schools. But when students of color were only a sixth of the student body across the country, states tended to funnel money into universities, keeping the cost relatively low. But now that black students are 40% of enrollment, states have stopped investing even though, again, it earns a dividend for those states. So other countries have learned from America's mid-century investment in education, and they've seen how much it paid off, and they are racing ahead of us in investing in education. So the U.S. economy was 30% of the global economy in 2000, and it's backed off to 24% today. Like, we are fading from the economic pie chart because we are not allocating our resources wisely. We're underinvesting in education and in other benefits that could help all of us. And much of that has tracked with the percentage of black people who are receiving education and the white perception that we're paying for their benefit. Right. Yeah, this all comes really down to that whole last place aversion thing. Like everything you've talked about. Like do you, you know, if you're listening to this podcast in your car, like do you want everybody to be better? Like, that seems like such a, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I want everybody to be better. But it's like, do you really? Do you want everybody? Because that's everyone. That's not just, like, your friends, your family, people that go to your school. It's people that don't go to your school. It's people that don't look anything like you. It's people that are in a different socioeconomic class than you. It's like, do you really even think about those people? Let alone, do you want them to benefit Mm -hmm. in society? Is like, a bigger question than what it seems like on the surface that most people would probably be like, oh, yeah, I want everyone to benefit. But mm-hmm. like putting a face to it, like, do you want the guy without an education who got arrested with possession of marijuana? Do you want his life to be better? Like, yeah. Do you actually? Right. I don't know. It'll make I can't better, answer it for but, you, but. But is that what you actually want? Yeah. And are you going to continue to want that even when politicians make dog whistles and cast public benefits as being like, well, well welfare queens are talking about how it's going to benefit entitled handouts and stuff like that. Like, do you Yeah, as if we can't want... create systems that mm-hmm. that doesn't happen as often. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So in America, and, and this kind of shows how this sometimes works, like most people don't see public education as being a racialized issue. And yet in America, there's a 30 point gap between white and black people and whether they want free college, whether they mm-hmm. think it's a good policy. So 53% of white people support free college. Versus eighty two percent of Hispanics and eighty six percent of blacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what and what's the? I wonder what the thinking is there. Why don't you want it? Well, because white people don't want to pay higher taxes in order to fund a benefit for everyone when they could instead afford to pay the tuition and lower taxes, and then it's only helping themselves. Versus, so there's like this idea of like, well, we don't want to pay for everyone to go to college. We just want to pay for our kids to go to college. But the thing is, or what they're missing is that college benefits the entire society. That college causes people to have better education, so it causes the entire economy to grow, and everyone benefits from that. And so public funding of college is actually what's better. And in other countries, they've figured this out. A third of the developed world has free tuition, and a third of the developed world has tuition capped at $2,600. We are lagging way behind in our support of education. Almost half of private school children are all go to schools that are all white. So private schools tend to be very white because it's a private benefit that white people can afford as an alternative to supporting a public benefit. But ironically, white children who attend all white schools achieve lower outcomes when tracked than white students who attend more diverse schools. That is crazy. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's not crazy in the fact that that's what it is, but it's just like... It's like the whole justification for having private schools initially. uh, So many of them started to be segregation academies and to be all white schools. And then to hear like that actually achieves lower outcomes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not even like, uh, you know, a lot of people think that they act, they do. Mm -hmm. But this is like, Like no, no, they studies real data is proving that it doesn't. Well, and, and then the scholars are like, well, why is that? And the thinking is because if students, the real world, if you want to participate in the economy, you're going to be participating in a multiracial economy. And if you've never learned how to interact with minorities or other cultures, 
you're going to be at a handicap if you've only ever been in like this little subculture. So it's not just the cost of racism, but it's the cost of white solidarity. Mm hmm. It is costing. And dollars. white insulation. Mm hmm. Well, mm-hmm. white uncomfortableness. It's or like, white privilege. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, mm-hmm. that's. Yeah. I can I mean, imagine that could be tough for someone that is sending their kids to like a mostly white private school and hearing that is probably like. You know, they're probably thinking, well, where are this? let me see the stats, you know. Well, and then people will say, I worked, my parents came over here from wherever and they worked hard and they, you know, did all these things. But yeah, and they were able to do that because they weren't oppressed because they were of their race. Mm-hmm. They weren't oppressed because of their race. And even, you know, people like, think about the Irish Irish people could still be white. Yeah, like, they they're say, still white. They're not, you know. They might say, nobody gave us anything, but it's like, well, but they didn't take it. They didn't take it. So, yeah, nobody gave you anything, but nobody burnt your house down because you were black. Nobody lynched you because you were black. Nobody raped your wife because she was black. No one, you know, bombed put you in, bombed you your house or pr- imprisoned you because you were black. So, and nobody stifled your achievement because you were black. Mm -hmm. But going back to the school situation, because this is, I think, a pretty compelling quote on this, is that there was a a group of social scientists at the Brown versus Board hearing for the Brown versus Board decision. There Mm -hmm. was a submission by a group of social scientists who were the, the leading social scientists of their day. And they have this quote. They say, those children who learn the prejudices of our society are being taught to gain personal status in an unrealistic and non-adaptive way. They're making an argument here for how segregation is costing white children. Mm -hmm. They say, when comparing themselves to members of the minority group, they are not required to evaluate themselves in terms of the more basic standards of actual personal ability and achievement. They often develop patterns of guilt feelings, rationalizations, and other mechanisms which they must use in an attempt to protect themselves from recognizing the essential injustice of their unrealistic fears and hatred of minority groups. Confusion, conflict, moral cynicism, and disrespect for authority may arise in majority group children as a consequence of being taught the moral, religious, and democratic principles of the brotherhood of man and the importance of justice and fair play by the same persons and institutions who, in their support of racial segregation and related practices, seem to be acting in a prejudiced and discriminatory manner. <laughs> that is like a mic drop. Mic drop. That is unbelievable. That was when? That, that, was, that was in the... For the Brown versus Board decision. It was a submission. I mean, you could say that today. Like, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's... Yeah. That is crazy. What a great wording of what's actually happening. And who said that? It's a group of social scientists that's... Come on, social scientists group. That, I mean, <laughs> weren't heard that much, but I mean, wow, that's like really well... We should post that. Yeah, we, you can do that. We can. <laughs> That's something we could do. Yeah. So one other way that we can say for education that racism is costing us is that there is an 18% difference in high school graduation rates between black and white students and an 8% difference in college graduation rates, which I think you can just attribute to the history, legacy, and modern barriers that are from racism. Like without racism and the past of slavery and the lack of reparations, you don't have that. And so how much is that costing us? Well, high school diplomas lead to an average of an $8,000 predicted difference in earnings per year. College graduation, on average, leads to an extra $26,000 a year. This is that GDP per capita you were talking about. Yeah, this is going back to earlier. How much is this This costing? This is how much money people are bringing to the economy. Yeah. So if you if you don't educate your population to graduate from high school or from college, there's a cost to society. Right. And what I'm saying is that that cost adds up when you do the math to $100 billion a year in lost earnings and $300 billion a year in lost productivity. Because your earnings is only part of your productivity. Right. Like you're earning more for your employer than you are for yourself and and for the economy as a whole. Like you create a product and you sell that product and your company gets some benefit and the customers get some benefit because they now have the access to the product. And then you get some benefit in your paycheck. But your actual productivity is about three times your earnings typically. Yeah. So the cost to society is like $300 billion a year just from educational differences. 
So here's some, some real rapid fire ones. And these I'm not going to go into all the detail for, but I just want to paint the picture and people can kind of just imagine it. Honestly, um, I feel like the picture you painted already is very clear. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> on but everything. Just, but yeah, this is just kind of extra. Just, there's even more. Like segregated businesses. During segregation, most segregated businesses throughout the entire South needed three to four bathrooms because they needed bathrooms for the white women, white men, and then oftentimes they had one bathroom for both black men and women, or they would have an extra two bathrooms. So just the cost of that, the inefficiency of that, having redundant waiting rooms at medical establishments throughout the entire South during segregation, there was a cost. They had separate entrances, separate waiting rooms, separate coffee machines and water fountains and like so much redundancy it's just silly and expensive trains didn't fill the train cars efficiently because they would have a half full white train car and a half full black train car so there was just inefficiencies all throughout the entire segregated economy train stops didn't have efficient stops at places that would like reduce the amount of time that people, your population would spend walking places because there would be less train stops in black communities. Or, and this is true today, that transit locations will often skip black communities because white people don't want people from that community being able to jump on a train and access our community. And so then you have inefficient allocation of transit stops that lowers the revenue that trains can bring in. It reduces the efficiency of the whole economy. Lynchings. How much did America lose because of lynchings? Not just because of 10,000 victims whose lives were lost and their entire working career and family, like the impact on their children who went parentless, but also the mental health effects of roughly a million white people who attended lynchings. I I mean, some lynchings had audiences, and we've done an episode on this, that 5,000 or 10,000 people that would watch these lynchings. And also the community, the black community, and the trauma inflicted on the black community from lynchings. We already talked about the reduction in patents, but how many other costs were there to lynchings and the trauma they inflicted and the way that they affected our psychology and mental health. Massacres like Tulsa. Like think of the cost of what Greenwood could have become if you have listened to our Tulsa episode, what it would be today if it hadn't been wiped out. The direct damage to Tulsa was 300 lives lost and $200 million in today's money worth of property damage. But that is not even the whole cost because that $200 million would likely have grown a hundredfold by now if it had been actually like invested in productive things. There were 38 race riots similar to Tulsa. Tulsa was the, the largest, but some of the other ones were almost equal in like scope. So in St. Louis, there was 150 people killed and 1,000 homes destroyed. In Atlanta, there was about 100 people killed and 1,000 homes destroyed. In places like Colfax, there was 150 killed. And there are many more of these. So real quick, what I don't think people realize either, and I'm sure there probably is a case study for this, and if there isn't, there should be. When we talk about the mental health of white people, because we always talk about how black criminality or black crime or poverty is a result of racism, but we don't talk about often how the traumatic effects on, like, because you can't lynch someone and then, well, they were doing it. They would go to church and then lynch someone. You can't practice your faith and lynch someone or attend a lynching. You can't raise kids after going to the after church lynching and there not be some effects. I think that there should, there is probably a, a major correlation between white, like mass shootings, and just the generation of the generation white of children who have engaged in like that heinous serial, like mass shootings, serial rapists, that type of thing. I bet, and I'm sure, and there's probably someone way smarter than me that has already made that correlation. But when you look at the enmity between the white generations from the boomers, specifically like the boomers to the hippies and from that generation to the Gen Xers and then the millennials and then, you know, the next generations. A lot of the discord and the craziness between those generations, I'm sure has to do with racism and what white kids were seeing from their white parents. Because I hear from white people all the time who talk about 
how their parents were part of the KKK or their grandparents were part of KKK or how what what their parents would say at the dinner table versus what they would say when they were in company of black people where, you know, the hypocrisy, how so many white children have left, white people have left Christianity and left their faith because of things that they saw from their parents. I mean, I, I'm sure... And I'm sure there's, you know, somebody will probably make a comment in one of our posts or something to tell us to read something. We haven't really fully explored this. But yeah, when you think about the mental health effects that continue on from generation to generation, I'm sure that all of it can be tied to, in some way, the impact that racism has had on the white person, on, on the white mental health. Yeah. That would be fascinating to fascinating. get into more. Mm-hmm. Running through more of these quickly, civil war. The recent estimates are 750,000 deaths. It's like upward adjustment from earlier estimates. So three quarters of a million lives lost from the civil war and 6% of the American workforce because the population was lower back then. So that wiped out 6% of our workforce and put us on a slower track of economic growth for generations. Where would our economy be now if it had not been for the civil war? The most comprehensive estimates of the economic costs of the war are those developed by Claudia Golden and Frank Lewis, and their estimates suggest that the government expenditures by both governments totaled $3.3 billion, and that the estimated value of human capital lost was $2.2 billion, and that the physical destruction was just about $1.5 billion. So $7 billion total. That might not sound big in terms of today's money, but that was two entire years of GDP at that time. So basically, it's set... It's the modern day equivalent of forty trillion dollars. Are you saying the Civil War was because of racism? Yes. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> if, if if you don't know, another one was the Cold War and the propaganda. And this is hard to put a dollar value on or a numerical, like a quantitative value on. But just how would the world be different if communists hadn't been able to use? There might be nations that fell to communism that would have remained non-authoritarian if not for the fact that communist propaganda was able to correctly and truly point to the fact that in Western democracies, in America, they don't care about people who look like you. And that was true, and they could show the proof because they had the video, and it was real. America didn't care about black and brown people. And so in many nations around the world, communism had this argument to make. And mostly, like the, the big concern here is just the countries falling into authoritarianism. I care more about that than even the economic system. is. Well, just that idea of we've just been talking about how our country yeah. could be better, your cities, your states, our country. But like, yeah, I didn't, I haven't even thought about how the world, the global economy. The whole world suffering. Yeah. Is because of American suffering. racism. Also, racially linked wars. The cost of the Iraq war was $1.9 trillion. Afghanistan cost the country $2.3 trillion. And that's just like the direct cost. That's not like the indirect cost or the lives lost. And in a world without white supremacy, first of all, 9-11 may still have happened, but it very well could have been averted. Bin Laden said in his letter to America that explained the attack that it was vengeance for past U.S. actions against Muslims. And that was not just made up. Like there, there were things that America did that were cruel and evil in Muslim countries. We, in some cases, we propped up evil dictators because they gave us economic deals that helped right. us. So, in a world without white supremacy, first of all, it, it may not have happened. But even if it had, how could the response of America potentially have been different? Particularly with the Iraq War, we rushed into war because of bad intelligence and anti-Muslim sentiment. And if there had not been that racist anti-Muslim sentiment, would we still have gone to war? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know the, how well the bad intelligence would have stood the test of more time if the whole process had been slowed and cooler heads had prevailed, but we very well could have averted that war that's cost us, again, $1.9 trillion in counting. Immigration. There's so much lost economic benefit from immigration and immigrants. And this is so counter to like the modern conservative propaganda, but immigrants are good for the U.S. economy. Economists agree on that. If you Google, what do economists think of immigration? Like, do that. Like, if you're conservative and you don't believe what I'm saying, find out what actual economists think of immigration. Well, wouldn't conservatives just say, we want legal immigration? Yeah, maybe they would. But then that's actually not borne out by conservative policy. 
it's also reduced legal immigration. But also, a couple of things about immigrants. First of all, they get de- immigrant communities get demonized as criminal, but actually immigrants commit crimes at about half the rate of native-born citizens. So they're actually less likely to commit crimes. So even, like, immigrants actually make America safer. Less crime per capita with more immigration because they commit crimes at lower rates. And part of that is because of the threat of deportation makes you less likely to commit a crime. But also there's something about people who are willing to give up their lives and have that ambition to go to another country to provide opportunity for their kids, where you tend to end up with populations who are willing to immigrate who are more entrepreneurial. Immigrants are twice as likely to start businesses yeah. as native and native-born populations. And that's not just true of in our context. That's true worldwide. Immigrants start more businesses. They're more entrepreneurial, commit crimes at lower rates. And we have missed out on a lot of economic benefit because of anti-immigrant sentiment. Yeah, but Um, aren't they stealing our jobs? No, because they are a population of more people who also create jobs because they create demand for products. And if you have a million immigrants come in, then they're not just taking a million jobs They're growing the economy by a million people. And they're also going to need housing, so there'll need to be houses built for them. And so then they're going to need grocery stores, and those will be new grocery stores going in. And like they they become a part of the. But I can feel people saying, but I don't want them to be better than me. (laughs) That's the last place of version. I I know, but I'm just saying, like, if you're thinking that, it's almost like, I mean, I could see if you're not a Christian, you can think that. Well, I don't have a call to love anybody except just myself, but this whole, you know, we're in the context of an episode where we're trying to explain to you, this actually is beneficial to you, even you being selfish and maybe not loving other people or having a call to love other people. It actually still is beneficial to you. Mm -hmm. But if you you want to live in a better world, a non-racist world is a better world for everyone. And and part of it maybe is just admitting, like maybe you do just need to admit, yeah, I don't want other people to be better than me. Mm-hmm. I would I probably I would a rather, good place to start. Yeah, I would rather suffer a little if it makes other people suffer more, so that I can be ahead. Yeah, right. That's hurting everybody. Yeah, yeah. including you. Yeah. It's actually hurting you, and I think that's the yeah. Another one running through. We're almost there. Redlining. The government's unwillingness to guarantee loans in black neighborhoods led to a spiral of underinvestment because if there's no loans, that bids down the property market and that reduces the return on investment for improving housing or improve, making neighborhood improvements. So there was just a downward spiral. Former red line neighborhoods have appreciated by 52% less than green lined neighborhoods. So that lack of government investment has actually now cost the, the whole U.S. economy, or roughly, I think about a half of the wealth in America is mortgage wealth. So it's like a huge portion of property taxes that is lost because of that underinvestment, a huge portion of wealth in the form of good housing is lost because of that underinvestment. Lead poisoning is a common, it's common in former redlined areas and racism is a reason why lead pipes have not been funded to be removed. In many poorer communities, there's a lack of funding to remove and update piping. So lead piping remains, even though five micrograms of lead can correlate with a loss of IQ of 1.5 IQ points per year for children who are poisoned by lead. It is Hmm. costing us in the form of poisoning our children in our community who are part of our future. And and that's because of racism. It's like hard to put a dollar value on how much that costs. Like if you're a parent, what's a dollar value on 1.5 points of IQ for your kids per year. Like you can't put a dollar value on that, but you can put a dollar value on the cost to fix it. And we're unwilling to do that largely because of racial attitudes. Health disparities. We talked about in a previous episode, we talked a little bit about this, but in Just Medicine, the book by Dana Bowen Matthew, there's an estimate of 83,570 minority patients that die every year because of healthcare disparities. Like when you add up the differentials, what's the cost of 83,000 lives lost. The lost income, the lost revenue from people just not being able to work their jobs anymore. The lost demand to the economy, the the payouts of insurance from the cost of life insurance policies, the cost of children not having parents to raise them, the cost, uh, like, it's astronomical. So in conclusion, what does this all add up to? I don't know what it all adds up to. Some of it's not even quantitative, but there's been multiple studies that have tried to put a number to it. 
One study just looked at Chicago. Arisa Navarro and her colleagues at the Chicago's Metropolitan Planning Council teamed up with the Urban Institute and asked what the cost of segregation in Chicago was. And they're not looking at the cost of racism as a whole, just segregation, just one aspect of racism. And they wanted to know that what was its negative impact on the quality of life. And they found that segregation was costing area workers about $4.4 billion in lost income and cost the local economy $8 billion. Compared to more integrated cities, 63,000 fewer Chicagoans were completing college, and 73% of that deficit was white people hmm. who were suffering as a result of segregation. The International Monetary Fund says, quote, because it prevents people from making the most of their economic potential, systemic racism carries significant economic costs. A less racist society can be an economically stronger one. For instance, the wealth gap between American whites and blacks is projected to cost the U.S. economy between $1 trillion and $1.5 trillion in lost consumption and investment between 2019 and 2028. This translates to a projected GDP penalty of four to six points in 2028. Oof. A 2020 Citigroup report calculated, quote, if racial gaps for blacks had been closed 20 years ago, the U.S. GDP could have benefited by an estimated $16 trillion by now. Wow. W.K. Kellogg Foundation says, quote, if the United States adopted policy interventions to close the racial disparities in health, education, incarceration, and jobs, which again is a fraction of what we've talked about this episode, the economy would be $8 trillion larger by 2050. So when people say, well, slavery's over, black people have the right to vote, they have all these rights, what more do you want? This is what we want. We want America to be trillions of dollars better. We want people to have the ability and the rights and the freedoms to become who God made them to be, to realize their dreams, to get jobs rather than to remain unemployed, to thrive and to have a good education and to be able to chase things and invent products and gain patents and become what they want to be, regardless of the color of their skin or regardless of their background or culture. We want more Hamiltons and more Black Panthers and more Black people able to produce what God has gifted their hands with the ability to produce so that all of us can grow together. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you're looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast and be able to vote for future topics, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. On our next episode, we will be discussing the Tuskegee syphilis study. We'll leave you with this quote from Thurgood Marshall. Where you see wrong or inequality or injustice, speak out. Because this is your country. This is your democracy. Make it, protect it, pass it on.